Welcome back, and this is our number two of Tampa Home Talk, and that was right on time as you were too, Leo, looking for the intro bed to come replay. So, all right, let's get to the stats and the numbers for hour two. What was your call now, Pat? Somebody was asking about those. They were looking for our numbers for the, you for the morning. You put glasses on. That's awesome. They're not gonna be able to, they were concerned they're not going to be able to find a house every week. They said... You know, they've been listening, and uh, they said it just keeps getting lower and lower. I told them I thought it was about 111 homes left. I, I, oh, I'm no. almost to the yeah. point where I'm just going to put up a cardboard sign that just says the end is near. I mean, if you're looking for a new home, that's, that's, that's where we're at. I mean, the end is near. Doomsday. I'm going to grow a beard, walk around in a, in, a, in a gray cloak, and just have that sign. So uh, our, you know, joining us for this next hour, we're going to chat a little bit about some residential stuff, but I want to go ahead and introduce our guest hanging with us for this hour, Mr. Tom Brutabaker. He's with Tam Bay Residential or Residential Realty. The Welcome. Tam Bay Commercial Tam Bay and Commercial. Tam Bay Business Brokers. Yeah, thank you for cleaning that up for me because I totally jacked that. But he was saying he's a, he's a statistician. Was that what you said? Statistician. statistician. State certified appraiser. Okay. So uh, we've been tracking the numbers since COVID. I think you'll love this. I'll actually give you this one. You can, well, it's not all of them, but it's part of them since this year. We've got the other ones on a different sheet, but I will tell you, here's the number. So what, here's what we pull, Tom, just so you know, we go into the MLS every Friday morning and we pull, we take out like condos, townhomes, villas, mobile homes, we take all those out. So we're just looking at single family homes just to get a feel for the market because that's the bulk of what most people want right so we're looking at how many homes are active pending sold we're following all the stats and so we look at three counties we look at hillsborough pasco and pinellas and so in our numbers it includes single family homes for those three counties and so this week the number of active homes on the market was 695 it's one of the lowest ones we've had in a little while last week it was 799 active listings so we have even less than we had last like over 100 homes less than we had last week at this time, a number of solds are way up too. Came in the last seven days of 1242. That's how many single family homes have sold in three counties. Last week it was 1018. And the number of pending home sales is, a th is 1165. And last week it was 1130. So those pendings and solds keep going up actives and, and everything keep going down. And uh, that kind of leads us into our next segment, which we're going to talk a little bit about the home affordability decreasing in the Tampa metro area alongside with national trends, right? Same as other cities are seeing all across the U.S. So let's just chat a little bit about what we'll get into that in a second. So stick around for that. And if you want, you know, more up-to-date information on your particular neighborhood, what your home's value is or any of that stuff, you can call or text us at our off-air number, which is 813-377-2775. We can give you a market analysis or a Evaluation on your home, 813-377-2775. Again, 813-377-2775. So, Tom, let's chat a little bit about the background. So, for some people, um, for example, Leo, Leo hasn't been here forever, so he might not remember, but I remember when I was a kid, Tam Bay was around, and I know Pat George will remember. Do you remember a company called Tam Bay Realty? Pat, do you remember that? Well, of course I do. I never thought they went away. So so talk about the story because they technically did and then you guys revived them. So let's chat right. about that. Uh, Doris Killian opened Tam Bay in 1968. In 1998, Caldwell Banker purchased them and they went dormant and I opened the old company. So he re revived Tam Bay. And what, when did you guys do that? What year? 2013. Okay. And um, so you do a lot of things. You do um, a lot of, on the commercial side, you do a lot of um, business sell, right. buy and sell. My business is pretty much split between commercial real estate and businesses. Although I do own a residential brokerage, I don't really foster that side of it too much. And I don't sell any houses myself. And I know your wife, her and I were actually in the same 
class a couple of moons ago for our yes. broker license. Um, so let's chat a little bit about the affordability and then we'll hop back on over to Tam Bay and um, tell the listener a little bit more about you guys. Pretty fascinating story, I think, how you guys revived that that old realty company that was around before I was alive and I was from here. So I knew Pat George would remember the name. So, you know, homes in the Tampa area, they're actually less affordable second quarter. This is the current reports. And with these numbers that we're tracking every week, we can see that's going to be consistent for the third quarter as well but they're they're typically less affordable right now than the historic averages alongside that national decline of home affordability um, while average workers are actually soaring in prices so what that says is basically that the wages are going up and affordability is dropping so uh, really when you look at this like just stepping outside of this information this is that bigger divide in, in what we've kind of mentioned briefly in the past as far as like the middle class kind of being wiped out wouldn't you say i wouldn't go as far to say the but middle th- but class, that's like if it continued but, like this that would be the trap but yeah i, I mean think. if you have everyone in the united states that can pick wherever they want to live and they decide they want to live in florida that's going to definitely drive up prices i mean it's just supply and demand yeah I mean, that's just the uh some of the other economic sectors you know they're seeing gradual recoveries from the pandemic but um home affordability just keeps making this backward slide um, so despite the 22% spike in median home prices, the same quarter of 2020, which that's kind of a little bit skewed, right? Because that was right after COVID. But we're at a record of 305 for the median prices right here in the Tampa Bay area. And uh, about 61% of the counties in the nation, uh, they, they have enough data to analyze how the median home price for single family homes and condos increased by at least 10% in this quarter. Um, and this was according to a report from Adam Data, which you know supplies some pretty good data there. I owned an appraisal firm for 16 years and back in uh, the height of the market, 2006, we were making two to two and a half percent monthly adjustments for time upward. And so I just, I, I, that's a very relevant point. If you don't mind, could you just break that down and tell a listener what that means when you say you're addressing two and a half percent for time? Because we, we talk all the time about how appraisers pull and I know how they pull data, but the average person doesn't know what you're talking about. Right. We analyze the data um, 12 to 24 months prior, and then we look at this 12 months, and then we're able to measure the appreciation how much the properties have gone up. And like you said, um, I'll do a very uh, controlled study. Yeah. I'll take very secure areas, uh, Carrollwood, very stable markets, and then I measure it and I use square footage as my um, accuracy, okay? And then we're able to measure how much the, you know, annually it's gone up, divide that by 12, and then if we're appraising something that was contracted six months ago and it went up 2% a month, we'll make a 12% upward adjustment for time. And that's the only way anything would ever appraise out today. Yeah. That's so that's and that's we do it kind of similar. So on the real estate side, we're gonna look at it a little bit different than appraisers, although I do use a lot of the same similarities that a appraisers do in terms of following the USPAP guidelines within a one mile radius, 20% of the square footage, all that sort of stuff. Um, But the time, so basically what that means is something that, you know, was purchased a year ago is not worth the same value as it is today. And we're seeing that right away. We can see that immediately in the, in the, in the data when we pull. So I did comps for a listing I went to last night, prime example. And I, you know, I try not to cross the major roads, which I know underwriting gets hung up on that stuff. Even if it's within a mile, try to stay within that concentrated area. And the data that I'm pulling, you can see it very obviously in the numbers from one comparable home, you know, listing to another. I pull it, there's there's none or very low number of active listings. So in this particular listing I went to last night, there was none. There was the active listings were zero. Uh, there was two that were pending, and those numbers were substantially higher than everything else that was sold. And, and that's the pending sales. I mean, they have not yet closed, but they're under contract. And then the sold sales, as you look back in time, the newer ones, there was you know one of the exceptions in there, but most of the newer sales, like closer to today's date, had higher prices than those associated even. Uh, we're not even looking six months back unless we don't have enough data, just because I think the, the data is so 
irrelevant really for what we're looking at mm -hmm. to price a home today to put it on the market. The flaw in the appraisal process is exactly that. We're using historical sales, sales data yeah. to determine today's value. And that's why we make those time adjustments. Yeah, I love it. We're going to um, continue this conversation a little bit more and just chat about some more of the things um, in, in the Adam data report. And then we're going to continue on the conversation with Tom and just talk about it. You'll, you'll love this too, Leo. Look, there's even Hernando and some of our numbers here, which we're going to chat about. When I've been we come saying back. Hernando's the next I'm very infatuated with it, Hernando. I think you're probably right. All right. This is Tampa Home Talker. Off your number, if you want to chime in on the conversation, you can call or text 813- 377-2775. Again, call or text 813-377-2775. We're happy to give you some info. 813-377-2775. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome home. This is Tampa Home Talk. You're listening to... Tampa Home Talk. Tampa Home Talk. You're listening to specifically Katrina Madewell. And Mr. Tom Brady Baker. Leo Kane hanging out. Adam Talley is already out. Yep. He was in for his first hour. I mean, he's going to have a busy day today because after today, he's not going to be able he, he's not going to be able to do anything till like Thursday. Pretty much. So yeah, he's got to get everything done today. I'm surprised we had him at all. I know. Me too. So basically, the, let's go back to the numbers a little bit. So this is up 48%, basically. It's up from 48% of the counties in the second quarter of 2020. Highest point in two years. Home prices have actually increased faster than wages. Not surprising at all in much of the country. Here, I'm not surprised by that at all. But again, we're having people move from places like California and New York that have been crazy expensive for a while now. Um, and now in the Adam data, they are counting four counties in the Tampa Bay metro area. So they are counting Hillsboro, Pasco, Pinellas, and Hernando. Now, Tom, the only reason why I don't factor Hernando into my numbers is the obvious. I would have to pull it from a different MLL system, LL system, different MLS system and add the data up. And it's not that good of an MLS system. Let's just face it, right? Like it's a, very appraisers antiquated. hate pulling data in Hernando. And I thought they were going to struck a deal with, with Pro, but they didn't actually end up doing that. They were supposed to, and their their director came from GTAR. So, yes, and so I know her. kind of Brenda Rabbit. I think she was going to Yep, I know her well. That. Served in a lot of committees with her, know her very well. The agents were in Hernando were intimidated thinking that the Tampa agents were gonna go take over their business and that's the reason they didn't wanna join us. That was the the rumor on it like twenty years ago. We're already doing it. Like if we're selling there, we're already a member of Hernando as a secondary board, so it's not doing anything but making data more difficult. I get it, right? Like if people had to I think if the MLS says and the boards had to do it again, would they would they agree to sell data to Zillow? Probably not, right? Like, so I understand their their point and their thought on it, but I just don't necessarily agree with it because as realtors, we can get access to the data anyway. So, right. I just choose not to do it because it's a lot more difficult, and it's it's I'm not going to do that at 7 a.m. on Friday morning, which is when we pull the data. So. Uh, Couple more points on this report from Adam Data. Pasco County actually saw the largest year over year median increase price up 32% to 250,000. Don't know if I totally agree with that, but that also would include North Pasco and West Pasco, so maybe. I, I know, I, I would agree with that. This is where all the sub, these are where all the developers are putting in their subdivisions. And this is where you're gonna have this spike in inventory and they're gonna, they're gonna go if they sell you a house today for 240 and they sell your neighbor one for 245, then they'll sell the one after that for 250. It's going to keep climbing. Yeah, yeah. So I easily believe that. So 24% increase in Hernando County, their median price, according to this, is now 228,900. 52 is the new 56. And yeah, I would agree with that. And Hillsborough County saw 20% increase to 295,000, which sounds also very low, but that's probably about right. This is for second quarter data of 2021. And um, this one for Hillsborough is the fourth highest increase in the country among counties with at least 1 million people so we're we've said that for a while that we're very high and uh, last but not least Pinellas County the year over year median increase increased 16 percent to 289.9 yeah I wish we could also couple this with the with the median um, income 
I wish we can couple this with income to just watch the correlation happen. Well, they're pulling up by quarter, and no one else is pulling median income really by quarter that I know of. But yeah, perhaps. I think the realtors are pulling it by quarter anyway. Yeah, exactly. So, all right, Tom, what do you think about this? Like, you're seeing this on firsthand, right? And I know you're not really doing residential, you're doing commercial, but you're still measuring some stuff, I'm sure, as it relates to the residential housing market. Correct. And are you guys seeing as many relocations into the state as we are? I can't comment on that. I'm not that involved in it. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. But now, so, commercially, we do. Okay. I have people from New York coming down. They're buying restaurants. They're, um, they tell me they're escaping the communist state of New York, and they're coming down here, and they're, they're getting rid of their businesses in New York, and they're coming and buying them here. And we're getting a lot of relocation on the commercial side. Have you, and it, it, this was interesting because I had really predicted that COVID was going to impact commercial more than anything. And I think it will, probably just not as much here as in some other states. Are any of those people that are moving in here buying restaurants, are they commenting about how it's hard to sell the business in New York or are they getting buyers for that? Because I've heard that there's entire buildings almost that are empty or like a third capacity. Yeah, they're saying that the landlords are still um, demanding the high rent and they're not going to get it i'm working with a group right now out of new york they were paying um a month in rent and the city of new york shut their restaurant down and a hotel turned it into a homeless shelter oh my gosh you can't pay that it's not fair and they said that they're, the landlords are still trying to get the sky high rent and there's a lot of vacant space there people are fleeing new york yeah, and California and Chicago mm -hmm. and <laughs> New Jersey and a lot of those other states as well. Yeah, it's so you're also you're buying and selling businesses as well. What percentage would you say is that versus commercial? 50-50. 50 percent of what I'm doing I sell businesses. Other okay. people a business intermediary. The other fifty percent is commercial real estate. So let me ask you this. I mean, there's uh, these statistics I've heard out there that um, ninety percent of businesses fail or 75% of restaurants fail within so many years. Is, is the restaurant one? Like what, what is the turnover on a restaurant? Man, pretty quick. Uh, generally about every five years. So it is um, like most restaurants don't last more than a couple of years then. But They're I've not... been, I've been looking for them since they survived the pandemic. Uh, they're holding on to them because now they're starting to make money again. They're doing better than their pre COVID numbers. And now it's time to make money. I'm, I have restaurant buyers and I can't find restaurants for them. Wow. That's pretty, that's incredible, really. Yeah, because I know like uh, down on Henderson by where I live, like I'd say a third of the restaurants have changed over. I mean, they're, they're, they're brand new restaurants in the same locations. So what kind of businesses do you represent? I'm very much a generalist. So I do some construction companies. I do some medical, uh, bars, restaurants, anything in business. Uh, I stay away from salons and and some of the smaller stuff. It's actually hard to find yeah. salons for people. But uh, I like construction. I like medical. What are the um, like? What are some good businesses to buy if someone's moving here from out of state? Everybody and wants the same thing. They're looking for an opportunity. What is it? They want low management, so they can be an absentee owner, have the business run itself, and that's why e-commerce businesses are on fire right now. What's an example of that? E-commerce like, business, someone well, no, no, no. well, no, like the, the low management businesses people are looking for. E-commerce would be a good example of that. Or a company that has uh, good management in place that is hired and they know what they're doing. It can be an absentee owner. For instance, I was trying to sell a medical practice and equity partners were looking at it. And they wouldn't have any management. They would keep um, a medical director on staff. So they wouldn't have to do anything but the marketing side of it and the administrative side. So how do you handle it when the business, like the license holder, wants to retire and step out, and then there's a whole business underneath it, but someone from out of state's not going to have the local Florida license? How do you handle that? Scenario? Or credentials, right? In some case, right? They work on uh, daycare centers is a great example of that. The new owner has to be licensed, so they might have uh, be an experienced director. They come in. They will operate under the seller's license for a very short period of time while they get theirs. Is that like a year or six months or what is that? What's that short period of time? No, we're talking weeks. Oh, wow. it depends yeah. on the business. There's too yeah. much liability otherwise. Yeah. I mean, that would make sense. I can, I don't know if I would want someone to 
come in and operate my real estate practice with me still being the, bro the broker. I don't know if that would work out. Uh, but so what kind of trends are you seeing on the commercial side, especially after COVID? Because I mean, there were some changes. I got destroyed when COVID first started in January of 20. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a lot of big investments under contract. And once it started, every single investor got scared, cancer canceled the contract. So we had to start all over again. Now it's it's better than it was before. But we're having the same issues that there is in residential. We don't have the inventory especially in the industrial market. Oh, that's I was going to ask you about that. Like, how is inventory right now? So same thing. Very, yeah. very low. So building shortage, they don't have stuff to sell. Correct. So how big is the increase or the impact on like on commercial period? Like, does it depend on the industry? Or? Property values are increasing. Uh, inven inventory is very, very tight. So, I mean, we look at the absorption rate here in the, and it probably depends on the business and what kind of, what kind of you know business or how it's zoned but i know residential real estate's like a two-week absorption rate right now you know as a whole what's that look like for a commercial it's well it depends uh we can go on loopnet loopnet is the zillow of commercial and you'll find properties on there but they're not the great properties do you, and you guys you have your own mls right commercial or no yes we have several databases i pay twenty six thousand dollars a year in data wow it's very expensive uh uh costar and LoopNet is number one uh there's catalyst and crexy and there's other other commercial databases but not everything is there right on, on LoopNet, which is open to the public like zillow right it's on costar costar lets it costar owns LoopNet, and you can put your listings on costar for free but it costs a king's ransom to search that database. Now yeah. to put your listing on to LoopNet, that's another king's ransom. Got it. And those two alone, I pay 840 a month wow. for those databases. All right, this is Tampa Home Talk. Stick around. We'll be back right after this break for some more commercial talk. <laughs> This is Tampa Home Talk. Thanks so much for joining us. And if you'd like to connect with myself or our guest, Mr. Tom Prudebaker, about buying a business or some commercial real estate, you can call or text 813-377-2775. And we'll know you're looking for Tom. 813-377-2775. So let's talk about the obvious, right? People, we get it all the time. I had a seller last night that I met with. He's like, I'm going to go ahead and sell now while prices are high because they're going to crash. And I say the same thing every week that there's too much real money in the market for it to crash. It'll slow down when we start seeing some economic indicators that slow down, like people losing jobs and that sort of stuff. But I don't think it's going to crash not as a whole it's just, it's just not going to too much real money in it right now is that the same for commercial commercial is not going to crash there's actually um bad rumors right now about commercial real estate crashing i'll talk about that in a few minutes but the commercial market follows the residential market by two years so we're good for a while and a lot of people will hate me for saying this but the residential market needs a correction well, definitely. It needs to slow down. Definitely. It's appreciating too fast. Mm -hmm. People can't buy a home. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of heartache out there. So. I agree, but it's hard. There's still a lot of um, REITs buying properties. There's still a lot of hedge funds buying properties. Supply and demand. Uh, the only thing that's going to slow it down, I think, is a rise in interest rates. I think so, too. I and that that's overdue as well. Yes. We are. I've been saying all along they should in, increase it about a quarter percent per month until they see enough obvious slowdown, then stop. You know, that's the right time. Well, but don't do what Jimmy Carter did. Yeah, you can't. He went up to 23%. Yeah. He was trying to slow inflation. Yeah, that will never work like that. He would, there'd be heads rolling, but. I, we haven't seen inflation like, like five, six percent would be astronomical in today's. I, I think literally a quarter percent, a quarter would would slow things down enough to even things out. I agree. Wouldn't be too drastic. It would be slow enough, you know, that it would just, it would be just a trickle, right, into the economy in terms of inflation. So it's trickle down economics? Well, I mean, you got to slow things down a little bit. They're moving, I would agree, they're moving way too quickly. 
You're, all the first time home buyers are priced completely out of the market. They don't have enough cash to compete with, you know, it's hard enough just to get an offer accepted. I would never, if I was a seller, I would not want to deal with a first time home buyer. Yeah. I mean, FHA and VA off the table. Like we haven't even seen an FHA or VA offer get accepted in so long that it's, it's literally cash or conventional and they're or, taking the ones that are giving them a high offer willing to waive appraisal. We, we have the uninformed sellers in that case. As an appraiser, I appraised 11,000 properties in my day. In the residential market, the FHA appraisal and the conventional appraisal is the same. The property has to conform to standards. You can't have rotted wood. There's some guidelines you have to follow. But if it's a decent house, it's going to pass us the same appraiser. Right. There's no difference. So the well, agents need to inform this. They're slight. Like you can't have any chips or peeling paint right. if the house was built before 78. Some little stuff like that. And I would agree. But typically people see as FHA or VA as a, a less stronger buyer. And you see that in the offer as well in terms of what the down payment is, what the escrow deposit is. So I think in general, those kind of go hand in hand, right? Like the days of a VA offer with a thousand dollar escrow just don't exist in this no. market. Right. It's pretty Absolutely. So w as it relates to commercial, I mean, I love your opinion on it as, as an appraiser for sure. And I would agree a lot of it's the same. We just had uh, a property where the pool was literally green. There was probably some plants growing out of it. And uh, the listing agent did not want to clean it up. And I'm like, I really hope this doesn't get tagged. Well, it appraiser did. really appraised it fine, but... What happened was when it went to underwriting and the investor looked at it, Fannie Mae said, no, we're considering this a sanitary and safety issue. It is. You need to clean the pool up. So that pool had to be a little bit better, much better looking than it was before it would pass. So I got a, you're an appraiser. So an in, in appraiser is in an obvious defect scenario where it's a minimum property standards um, item, such as the pool being green. And the appraiser just doesn't flag it. That's that should be. Well, they want to know more. Like, does the pump work? So, if the pump and stuff works and the electrics on, but the pool's green, it doesn't take long to turn a pool green. Really, I mean, a week of rain, you have a green pool, right? If, it's, if nothing's going on with it. Right. They don't like green pools. Yeah, yeah. I we try to minimize that. I don't let any green pools happen on my listings because I know it's going to get flagged. I know it will. But yeah, it took probably a solid week of cleaning up on that pool to get it through the minimum standards. So, but um, one of the things you were commenting on the break was apartment buildings. You're saying a lot of people are moving here from out of state that really want to buy apartment buildings? It's the hedge funds and the REITs. Oh. They buy the class A apartment buildings, the newer, sexy 500 unit apartment buildings. They're the ones buying those. Now, they will never hit the market. So these these multifamily brokers have a list of all their hedge funds. So when they have one coming on the market, they just go down the list, they find a buyer, it never hits the market. You can't go on LoopNet and find a nice apartment building for sale. They don't exist. So we have to go behind the scenes and, and call these brokers and find out what they have. Yeah, in many ways, commercial real estate operates a lot like residential real estate did back in the day, like pre-MLS data sharing, right? Where it literally was the broker matching the buyer, the broker matching the other broker's buyer. Like that's pretty much how real estate used to be. And I'd say commercial is still very much that way. Commercial, I don't put my listings in the MLS and most brokers don't maybe five or 10% of the commercial listings will make it in the MLS. Are you talking about commercial or residential? Commercial. Or okay. We don't have any uh, offer of compensation. And those are deals you have to make with the broker while you're transacting. So that's a thing that's very, very different. And you guys really don't subscribe to like Florida Realtors or NAR, right? As a commercial broker. Right. I am a realtor. I do belong to Fire and NAR. Mm -hmm. And I belong to the commercial board, which is Florida Gulf Coast Commercial Association Realtors. But that's like optional. Like in the in the, it is in the residential world, they hijack your ability to use MLS or have an e-key or any of that unless you are a member. Right. It's not really that way on commercial. Well, we in, in commercial, we don't use lock boxes. Right. Right. So you can, you can fully function as a commercial broker without ever joining the board far or nar. 
Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing that we've seen. And like right now, it's gotten so competitive on the real estate side that they're literally trying to control to the day with paperwork and everything. It's so regulated, like how long stuff can be off the market. Because I mean, there's many times, Tom, that I'll take a listing while we're in the preparation stage, but it's not ready to go live. It doesn't mean I'm not going to cooperate with another broker. It just means it's not ready yet. But they're really like taking that to a whole new level. Like NARA stepped in and said, no, you're going to get this waiver of MLS entry signed. You're going to tell us exactly what day it's going on the market. And you're going to supply us with all that information. I just had a, an agent come to me and said, hey, I, um, I had a buyer for this house. So we wanted to, to set the appointment and uh, they weren't accepting any any showings until Saturday. And this was for residential. Mm -hmm. And on Friday, it shows up pending. So the agent sticks it out there, and they they double dip it. Ah, oh. yeah. I mean, I know that's what they were trying to avoid. I would say in my case, that's not so. It's more of just really like a preparation type thing. Like it's just not ready. Mm -hmm. I don't have photos back. It's not staged yet. The owner's still getting stuff out. Whatever it is. A good agent will almost never list a property on the first appointment. They will have the seller go and make it show ready. You have one chance to make That's a right. first impression. I agree with you, hundred percent. And they always want to get the highest value. You want the highest value, you better you better have it ready to go. Get it right out of the gate, and that's where the agent's really going to come into to play. So, talk a little bit about some of the cap rates that are going on out there. Like in general, what kind of cap rates are you seeing for commercial? That's a great question. You know, when let's talk about where to invest first and then we'll segue yeah. into cap rate a little bit. And, and let's also explain cap rate too. Right. Cap rate is uh, short for capitalization rate. That is a snapshot of the investors, the purchasers return on investment for the first year of acquisition. So year one, what is their return in, on investment going to make? Yeah. So to simplify it a little bit, more so it's like if you were to take cash and buy that what kind of interest would you get on that return if you were like as opposed to like taking that money and sticking in a cd you can see what the rate is it's kind of like how they do it in the real estate world through right. cap rate. well here's something i have to mention first the lower the cap rate the higher the value right the higher the cap rate the lower the value because we take the net operating income divide that by the cap rate to get the price Correct. Okay. I'm not going to get into that too much today. But a novice investor, the first acquisition is a house. A house is going to be the lowest rate of return. You have a house, you're not going to get rich unless you're going up 2% a month in property value like we are today. Yeah. That so it's, it's a great itself. time to own a house. Yeah. Then they graduate and go to, uh, they'll get a quadruplex and then they'll get a small apartment building like in St. Petersburg, an older um, 8, 10, 12 unit apartment building. Which is important to note that anything four units or less falls under that residential scope. The minute you hit five units or more, you're now under the commercial realm. That is correct. Investors will call me and they'll say, hey, I want to buy an apartment building and I want a 10% cap rate. And immediately I know they don't know what they're talking about because now those class A apartment buildings that the hedge funds and the REITs buy, they're buying those at a three and a half percent cap rate. Yes. That's it. That That's is a market, horrible yeah. rate of return. I don't know who would buy an investment like that. They've got an influx of cash on the stock market, mm -hmm. like like a lot of these other companies. It is safe. So and they secure. can they can burn investors' cash. That's how they have that low of a cap rate to buy. The less most risk, people wouldn't put put I wouldn't put my money into a property for three and a half percent cap rate. We also get stuck in the ten thirty one trap which is the 1031 exchange when you sell real estate to buy real estate and you have to find and spend the money anywhere or you get taxed on it. Yeah. You That's a good topic. We should, yeah. we should talk about that too. The 1031. And that, that may change. <laughs> like from this time next year, that could very quickly change. But here's the deal. Everyone wants to buy an apartment building and that's what they're comfortable with. They understand residential dwellings. Yeah. Makes and, sense. and they get it. Here's the problem. I would not buy an apartment. You have to rent to average people. Average people, they have deaths in the family, they lose their job, they get divorced. Life happens, they're not professionals. I would rather rent to a professional than to a person. So you're talking about like a commercial rental? Or no? Yes, yes. Okay. We're going to break. All right, so we'll talk about where to invest then 
when we come back right after this break, I'm sure you guys hear the music rolling in, which means we are rolling to our final break of the show. Our off air number is 813-377-2775. Again, 813-377-2775. That's our off-air number. You can call or text us if you want more info. And if you want to know what to invest at, stick around. We're going to tell you where is a good place to put money when we come back right after this break. 813-377-2775. We'll be back in a moment. Hang around. Welcome home. Last segment. You've been with us for almost two hours. Thank you for joining us for all or part of your Friday morning. I know Pat George has been with us for the entire two hours, and we appreciate his uh, producing ship. Um, I'm still like, this market so hot. Where should I be looking to invest my money? The number one commodity right now is, is industrial. That makes sense. It's you not sexy, uh, it's, it's but it is in extreme high demand. All the uh, retailers, you see, I want to talk about this first. There's a bad rumor that commercial real estate is crashing. Everybody says that. There's two segments of commercial that is not doing well. The one is the super regional shopping centers, your Westfield malls. Those things are going to be redevelopment projects. Right now, Amazon, rumor has it, Amazon has their eyes set on these things to fail, and they want to turn them into fulfillment centers. As a result of that, all these on online retailers are opening warehouses, and therefore we have a shortage of warehouse space. Uh, the second sector is what I call institutional office. You see these big 40,000 square foot office buildings and there's seven cars in the front because they sent everybody home to work. Those are going to be hurting bad. Now, right now in Hillsborough County, Tampa alone, we have 3 million vacant square feet of space. Two million of that is sublease space. So that means the tenants are still paying rent on all that space. Eventually, when those leases run out, then the landlords are going to feel the pinch. So why, why like in residential, I, I want to break a lease, I just break a lease. Why, why don't businesses do that? Is there different rules in effect for that? Because I mean, like if I had a five-year lease and I decided, hey, everyone's working from home, I'm like, I'm breaking my five-year lease. You'd have to file bankruptcy to do that. And a lot of these are credit tenants. And a credit tenant is a household name. Campbell Soup is a credit tenant. They were looking at renting a warehouse that I had listed. So Campbell Soup isn't going to default on their lease. So they can afford to pay it. When dixie when dixie uh, closed a lot of stores, uh, Sweet Bay, when Sweet Bay was around, they closed a lot of stores. They were paying $55,000 a month in rent just for one of these stores. And they paid that for several years. Well, the landlord didn't even try to sell it or lease it to somebody else and toward, until it got toward the end because they were enjoying rent for free. So these businesses, unlike a residential, the businesses just feel obligated to or have to pay the rent then? That is correct. So they will continue to pay until then. Uh, Baycare, you know, different, you know, big companies like that, they will continue to pay the rent. So if I were to buy an investment property, I would buy multi-tenanted industrial what is that warehouse uh, it's, it's usually called flex space where you have office in the front warehouse in the back so mixed use so it, yes they might have you know uh, five six ten twelve units in one building all industrial and the the lease rates went up a lot man a few years ago typical lease rate was seven dollars a foot and now we're up to twelve dollars a foot it's really increased quite a bit. That's over what period of time? A few years. Wow. It went up a lot. Wow. Uh, retail is doing very well. Like I said, when you stepped out, uh, the super regional malls are hurting bad, but you go down the street, you don't see any vacancies. Yeah, Re retail is doing very well. Now, if you go north, um, Pasco County, Port Ritchie, you might find more vacancy than you would in Tampa, but it's, it's very What about low. all the strip centers? There's a ton of strip centers with businesses that are shut down. Mm, I don't see it. I don't see it. Along Bush Boulevard? Bush Boulevard around Armenia? And you, I just saw a lot of that. Hmm. Do you have a lot around you, Leo? A lot of vacancies in that area? We have some new office 
condo, I call them office condominiums, but the, the, the <laughs> tall office buildings, we have a lot of those that are going up by like near armature works. And I just, there it's, it's still ghost town. Those garages are completely empty. Hmm. When they were building those pre pandemic, I thought they were crazy for building new offices because I knew the trend. We had a, a high vacancy rate right now. I'm seeing different reports from 8% to 13%. I think 13% is a closer vacancy rate for office right now. Uh, but as, as far as what you were saying about the retail, uh, we only have a 4% vacancy rate on retail right now. And we have a 3% vacancy rate on industrial. And that oh, industrial surprising. is not great industrial. You hmm. know, uh, when I mean by great industrial, I mean dock high doors, 18 to 24 foot ceilings. You know, we're talking smaller, older. Well, let's talk about one more thing that we don't probably want to run out of time to talk about, and that's commercial leasing, having sales tax. I know that Florida Realtors has been trying to push this on a legislative level for a very long time to get rid of the tax on commercial lease. Absolutely right. Florida is the only state in the country to have commercial lease tax. Wow. Surprising. Really? I didn't know we we're the only state. It's a lot of money, too, because in Hillsborough County right now, it went down and it's been going down every year. Like you said, we've been putting pressure on the legislature to remove that. Yeah, which they and, still have yet to do. Hillsborough County, seven and a half percent. So what do they do with the money for the sales tax on commercial lease? Where do, do you know where that money goes? What fund? Uh, the, the, I'm not sure what fund, but the state gets the majority of it and then the counties usually get a one percent bump except for hillsborough when they had the last referendum they they raised that a lot it was a knee-jerk reaction and no one really thought that through yeah and i'm not real happy with the county commissioners it's another whole story in itself for sure so let's let's touch on the final thing leo you're mentioning on 1031 exchanges so 1031s i mean right now as the time this is airing is a great way to defer capital gain tax pretty much indefinitely as long as you're going to hold on to some real estate pretty much you just got to sell real estate and then buy real estate and it needs to be quote unquote like real estate which is very loosely it defined. is very loose, yeah. So, uh, so when when they talk about like kind ex exchanges, um, have you seen where people? Well, I guess you could technically move it from residential commercial. As long as it it's investment, four to five units, it's, right? It has to be investment property. You can't take it from a, a business gain and put it in a real estate. So when they say like kind, doesn't mean you can go from warehouse to warehouse. You can put it from warehouse to multifamily. You can take it from multifamily to retail. It does not matter. It has to be like kind. However, Meaning if you, just real estate, <laughs> yes, just real estate. If you're, if someone's going to exercise a 1031 exchange, they cannot accept any funds at closing. It has to go yeah. to a third party intermediary. Yeah, qualified We have to set that up yep. ahead advance. of time. Yep. They have 45 days to identify a property and 180 days to close that property. And that's where they get tricky because like you're trying to get offers accepted. You can't get offers accepted. And that's how really bad real estate moves yeah. because they have to spend the money. Well, they usually just get it. You want to get all that done in advance before you actually close or delay closing. You know, don't take the money. That's the big thing right there. So, all right. All right this is Tampa Home Talk. Great having you on, Tom. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. And it's Brood Baker. Let me correct you. Brood Baker. Brood Baker. Brood Baker. No D. <laughs> With Tampa Bay Realty, this is Tampa Home Talk, and I'm your host, Katrina Madewell of Keller Williams Realty. Thanks so much for joining us this week, and have a safe 4th of July. We'll be back next week at 8 a.m.